This is Brent, Alan Winters, CommonLawyer.com. That's www.commonlawyer.com. Coming to you from the remote hinterlands of the Wabash River Valley bottoms, where we are moving into the middle of December. We are into the middle of December. And it's downright warm still, damp, but warm. It seems now that the policy worldwide is open borders, and it is politically incorrect to say otherwise. All nations are to open their borders. Jihadists and other pagans of all kinds, armed with weapons and intent to kill, are to range wide and far throughout the world. Apparently, jihad is sexy to the effeminate, left-wing, lawless, godless, feel-good, crowd. They love blood, and then they love the drama of acting appalled when it occurs, when isolated jihad attacks occurs, and men and women and children lie dead. It's appealing to them, and the lawlessness that comes with all of that, called Islamic law, Sharia law, Roman law, Kabbalistic, Rabbinic, Pharisaical law, all of that appeals to them because it allows them amidst the confusion, to perpetrate and practice and push to the limit their vicious lusts upon others and upon each other and themselves. Such human debris now holds the levers of power in a great many instances in our own country, just as such perverted persons got hold of the levers of power in Nazi Germany. Sadists, like Goebbels, who had a lust for blood as long as they could watch it and they didn't have to be at risk themselves in their own minds. A lust for pain in other people and watching. And what is the remedy? The remedy to the lawlessness of false pseudo-law, Sharia, Islamic, Roman, the Romanist, Kabbalistic Phariseeism, Talmudism. What is the Remedy to all of the law of the evil empire, the only remedy to false law, to lawlessness, and that's what false law is, the only remedy, the only remedy to lawlessness is true law. And true law, the only true law from the only true lawgiver, says James, comes in two volumes. The laws of nature The first volume, unwritten, the laws of nature, meant to be observed and followed. The second volume, the laws of nature's God, Blackstone tells us, this second volume is written, and we call it our Bible. These two volumes, taken together, reveal to mankind the will of the true lawgiver, and the will of the true lawgiver is law. Some folk just call it the will of God, and wherever it goes... Says Coverdale, it brings order, and he's right. It unmasks the huckster, shows him, shows him for what he is. No, there is no other remedy to annihilate, eliminate the lawlessness of what we see around us now. And remember, lawlessness is not an idea that floats around in the air. Lawlessness is always a person, and there are many lawless persons around us now, persons, folk who have abandoned themselves with a high hand to utter lawlessness. But first, they want you to join them in word. You must agree with them. That's called today political correctness. If you do not, they'll come after you. Paul, the apostle, tells us that in Romans chapter 1. You see it in life around us in the laws of nature. And the examples of it, God wants us to know more specifically, he has recorded in writing in the Bible. Well, let's get to it, as Isaiah says, to the law. To the law. The law. Not just any excuse for law. To the law and the testimony. The law is what God says you better be doing or not doing. And his testimony is his affidavit of what has happened. And what happened to those folks that did or did not do as he told them, followed his will? Yes, the Bible is a set of affidavits, God's testimony, and sometimes characterized as 
Ritz command to do or not do this or that thing. Well, we're moving through that fifth writing of the Bible, a land deed given to the nation Israel to transfer the land called Canaan specifically, laying down its boundaries precisely, and then listing chapter 5, its conditions of tenancy, And then the rest of the book expounds, explains, elucidates those ten conditions, called the Ten Commandments, those are ten conditions of land tenancy, expounds them in order. We're in chapter 15. Chapter 15, and that is the section of Deuteronomy that expounds what we call today the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments. Those commandments are the conditions of land tenancy applicable to every people and nation on the face of our planet. The Sabbath, I like to call it the Sabbath principle, includes much more than just every seven days. It also includes every seven years God operates on such a cycle, and also for the land on every seven times seven years. For instance, we're here in Deuteronomy 15, and it says that no one that no one is allowed to bind himself in service as a servant, to another person for more than seven years. At the end of seven years, he is entitled, according to the operation of God's law, it is God's entitlement, he says that, release from bondage. No debt of a bond servant can last more than seven years, unless the servant wishes and chooses to serve in that position, maybe he likes it. Maybe the living he gets for him and his family is enough for him. He likes it. He likes his master, his employer, and he wants to stay. But in all events, the master, the employer, must release him if he wants to go after seven years. And then it says this, verse 7, chapter 2. If there be a poor man of one of your brethren within any of the jurisdiction of your gates. That means within the jurisdiction of your local government, your courts, in your land which the ever alive your lawgiver gives you, you shall not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide unto him, and surely lend him sufficient for his need, in that which he wants. Beware, that there be not a thought in your wicked heart, saying as follows, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him naught, and he cry unto the ever alive against you, and it be sin unto you. You shall surely give him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give unto him, because that for this thing the ever alive, the Lord your God, shall bless you, in all your works, and in all that you put your hand unto. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I charge you, saying as follows, You shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor, and to your needy in your land. First it may be noted that all government is local. It says here, verse 7, It does not address some political problem in the capital city. It says, if there be a poor man of one of your brethren within the jurisdiction of your gates, right there in your little village, within the jurisdiction, the purview of the courts of your little town. That's the way it starts. And God's law demands that men exercise government locally, Old Tip O'Neill was wrong about a lot of things, but he said some right things. Of course, he did otherwise. But he said, uh, he was known for saying, all politics is local. Well, that's true. But all of God's government is local. It comes down to the man and the woman and how a man and a woman deal with horizontally with other men and women. Second, I notice here, it says you're to open your hand wide unto your brother and lend him enough for his, now watch this word, enough for his need. Which need? 
says here, the need which he wants. You shall give him enough for his need which he wants. And going on the principle that We ought to listen as close to what the Bible does not say as to what it does say. We observe this. We observe it does not say, you shall lend him enough for his need, period. It does not say, you shall lend him enough for his wants, what he wants, period. No, it puts the two together. You shall surely. That means you better do it. You better lend him enough for his need, which he wants. If a man doesn't want what he needs, you have no obligation to him. And if a man doesn't need what he wants, you have no obligation to him, and it's up to you. You, friend, neighbor, and relative, to discern for yourself what it is this man needs. Does he need a $500,000 home? Does he need tobacco? Does he need a bottle of wine? Well, he may want it, but it is not his need. It is not his necessary. I've talked to folk who used to live behind the place where I lived, way out west. I'd talk to folk and try to give them something I thought they needed. A hamburger, for example. They were poor. They were destitute. But they wouldn't take it. The Bible says if a fellow doesn't want it, if he doesn't want what you think is his need... You have no obligation to get it to him. And, of course, that's the problem. The problem with the welfare system. When I farmed and raised livestock for a living, I had a number of children. We had a big garden. We had all the milk we could drink because we were milking. We even had all the deer meat we could eat. The neighbors would shoot them. And they didn't want to eat them. They just liked to go hunting. They'd bring them to us and say, we don't want them to go to waste. Well, two or three of those, and that makes up a lot of meat. In that respect, we were living pretty high on the hog. High on the hog. That means we weren't eating the low meat. We were eating up in the tenderloins. That means we weren't living close to the bone. We were gaining weight. Farming, raising livestock, keeping garden and feasting on deer meat. But yet, the government welfare bureaucrats would troll the countryside looking for people and families whom they could put on the welfare rolls. And there are more welfare programs out there than are imaginable. If a person wants to take it, he can get milk and meat and bread and money and food stamps. And all you have to do is say you qualify, and they'll force it down your throat. Matter of fact, it was a political pitch. They were in the nature of salesmen coming out and saying, oh, we can give you this, we can give you that. And I'd say, well, I don't need it. They'd say, well, no, I think you do need it. I'd say, well, I don't know what you know about it, but let's say this, I don't want it. Well, it doesn't make any difference whether you want it. If you need it, we're going to give it to you. And then I'd say, well, I neither need it nor want it. Of course, they'd disagree with that too. But the object of government is, in America, is to get everyone dependent upon them. And, of course, then after everyone is dependent upon them, then the government can control everyone. If you're dependent upon the government for food, you'll be under their control. That's why it says here, You shall surely lend to give to him what he needs enough for his need which he wants. And if he doesn't want it, you're not to try to give it to him. And if he wants it, but he doesn't need it, you're not to try to give it to him. I can say with David the depths of the wisdom and the knowledge and the wonder of God's law, his will for man, for the enjoyment of living. And remember, we're expounding The Sabbath principle. The word Sabbath, I'll drop a footnote here at the end. Sabbath, also in the Hebrew tongue, it's a Hebrew word, means seven. And in the Bible, the will of God, the Sabbath principle, embraces seven days, seven years, seven times seventy years. 
and a whole lot of other things here we're discussing. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. That's www.commonlawyer.com. Back for the second segment of the hour, talking about the laws of nature's God. Our Bible, the fifth writing, called Deuteronomy chapter 16, says this, Observe the month of Abab, Abab, and carry out the Passover unto the ever alive, the Lord your God. The word Abab, it's been Germanized some. The ancient Hebrews probably said Avav, Avav with V's, softer, but the Hebrew root means tender as of a green shoot, or a green new head of grain. And the month Avab is so called because that is the time of the grain coming in green. In the head, or as we used to say, in the ear. In America, we call heads of wheat and barley and oats, we call those, where the grain is, we call those heads. But in time past, in the English tongue, they were called ears, as we call ears of corn yet today. Well, they were to carry out what is called the Passover. Verse 2, you shall therefore sacrifice the Passover that is, the Passover lamb, unto the Lord your God, of the flock and the herd, in the place which the Lord, the ever alive, shall choose to place his name there. The Passover was an extra solemn meal to be held only in the great city, Jerusalem. That's what it means here when it says, in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name, his name there. Verse 3, you shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction or harassment. For you came forth out of the land of Egypt, in haste. That means stepping and fetching in a hurry. That you may remember the day when you came forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. But now down in verse 8 it says, Six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day shall be a solemn assembly unto the Lord your God. You shall do no work therein. Then verse 9, Seven weeks shall you number unto you, begin to number the seven weeks from such time as you begin to put the sickle, as you begin to put the sickle into the grain. Simply put, that means begin to number the seven weeks from the time you began to harvest grain. Well, the grain has to turn from green to brown and rather dry so that it can be threshed out of the Heads, and it is from the time of the full ripening of the grain that the seven weeks are to begin to be numbered. Bottom line, what he's saying here is, when you start to do the harvest, the seven weeks after that is a time of happiness, of feasting. It says, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, and the Levite that is within the jurisdiction of your gates, that is your courts, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are among you. And in all this, remember, you were a bondman, a bondman down in Egypt. All of this is for remembrance of something that happened in the past, a liberation, a delivery from bondage that God had effected had given to his people. And after, verse 13, you've gathered your grain and your wine, you shall rejoice in your feast, you, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, all that are within the jurisdiction of your gates, that is, your courts in your local villages. 
Verse 14, fascinating phrase says, You shall rejoice in your feast. This, friends, neighbors, and kin, is not an option. It's a requirement. You are to enjoy yourself, whether you like it or not. And you are to rejoice because when the harvest comes in, it's obvious God has blessed you. Again, we see that in the case of the harvest, which means the case of payday, you are to be happy and to acknowledge that God has given all this to you. And not give it all away, but he says here, enjoy it. You and your family, verse 16, three times a year shall all your males, all your males appear before before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose. Again, speaking of the capital city called Jerusalem, they weren't there yet. They had not yet conquered the land. He said, I'll tell you where the place is. Three times a year, all your males, no girls allowed, shall appear before the Lord your God in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles. So the men, including the boys, the males, are to appear three times, no girls allowed, in Jerusalem, that's what it's going to be, the capital city, Time number one, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Time number two, the Feast of Weeks. And time number three, the Feast of Tabernacles. A tabernacle is a booth, a shanty, a shack. All this in remembrance of the delivery from Egypt and the wandering in the wilderness when they lived in hovels and tents and shacks and booths. Many first principles are here to be acknowledged and followed. Folks say, well, this isn't applicable anymore. Well, of course it's applicable. The first principles, these activities here, of which we've read, the first principles, these are intended to teach men to obey, are always applicable. Chief among them is to be thankful. Thankful. Number two is to recognize that All of the things that God says that men ought to do, His will for man, are for man, as Jesus Christ put it. And this is just one example. The Sabbath is not to be a burden to men. The Sabbath is made for man. And He said, not man, for the Sabbath. And, of course, he said, I am Lord of the Sabbath, and I can make that pronouncement, and he did. And the thread running through these paragraphs here is that man is to enjoy that which God has given to him. He is commanded to enjoy that which God has given through the harvest. You know, as a farmer, payday generally comes yearly, once a year. And that payday is the harvest, the grain. Or if it's shearing time for the sheep, it's that time of the year when you shear. To sum up these paragraphs at the beginning of chapter 16, they all revolve around the idea of the Passover that occurred in Egypt and God's desire that his people remember the Passover. The Passover, that's when God passed over passed over Israel, the Israelites, the household upon which they had struck a streak of the blood of the lamb, the blood of the Passover lamb, which they had killed. And then they feasted upon the land that night in haste because they were to be taken out of Egypt. Hats on head, shoes on feet, staff in hand, eating bread, bread of which they did not have time to let rise with leaven. We'd call it flat bread today. And this Passover is melted into the harvest, the blessing of God, payday, and a big payday it was. And all of this is about remembrance, remembrance of something that happened in the past. Now here we see a first principle of all of the Bible, so I'll drop a footnote, discuss it just a bit. The Bible has a good many things in the Older Testament that God's people today do not observe. Specifically, all of the Levitical priesthood and the trappings that go with it. And the reason for that is that all of those things that the Levites did, the priesthood of Israel in the Older Testament, were to teach 
to show forth and tell about something to provide object lessons about something that would happen in the future. Will that which the doings and the trappings of the Levitical priesthood foretold has now happened come to pass so it would be useless, indeed meaningless, to continue those practices? As the Bible says, those things of which the Levitical priesthood and all its trappings and clothing and utensils, the sacrifices, that's all fulfilled. It was pointing forward to something that would happen. It did happen. Now all that ceases. That's the purpose of the book of Hebrews, to make that point abundantly clear. So all of the Levitical priesthood look forward. But that to which the Bible here speaks, Deuteronomy, Chapter 16 is intended to get God's people to look back, not forward, back in the remembrance of something that happened. These things here, namely, what the Bible calls here the Passover Supper, is a solemn set of activities intended to remind men of something that happened in the past. Jesus Christ observed the Passover Supper with his disciples. He said there, this do in... Remembrance. Remembrance is something looking back to something that happened. So we say that the things that God gave to his people to look forward that have been fulfilled, we no longer practice. And the Bible tells us to no longer practice them. These are unneedful. But the activities and solemn things, the ceremonies God has given us to remind us to look back, those He wants us to keep practicing. That is why, friends, neighbors, and kin, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, we call it, we still practice. No, we do not practice the Mass. The Mass, that's something different. That's something Babylonian, pagan. We practice the Lord's Supper, as Jesus Christ commanded, and as Israel has been practicing since the days they left Egypt at that first Passover. We do that to remind ourselves that God, though he annihilated the firstborn of all of the Egyptians, all of those not within his purview of his kingdom, having not come into its jurisdiction, but those he had chosen out to be in his kingdom. He says, if I see the blood of the lamb streaked on your doorposts, and the transom post over top of the door, the angel of death will pass over your house. Your house. Passover is a family matter. More even than an individual matter. I told a fellow yesterday, contemplating marriage, a bit of a impromptu counseling session. And I said to him, because it had been said to me, and I found it to be true. As our common law puts it, I said, your home, your home is your castle. That's the old common law castle doctrine. And you and your wife-to-be, it is your castle. And the Bible says that your wife is to be keeper at home. That phrase, I told him, keeper at home, translates one Greek word in the New Testament It's better translated today. According to our English usage today, it's better to be translated that wives are to be home guards because that old word keep and keeper is a martial word having to do with aggressive guarding to the point, if necessary, of violence. That's what women are to be, the home guard, and without them there is no home guard You want evil to pass over your house, to stay away, guard your home. It is your castle. According to our law, regardless of what the useful idiots of the evil empire say, even down in the land of Egypt, the land of bondage, while the Israelites, the people of God, were in the throes of the most oppressive of taxation, income taxation, God said, your home is your refuge from death. Do as I say and you'll be safe there. That's what Passover is all about. You being the guardian of your home. And you do it by obeying God. This is Brent. Alan Winters, 
It's gross darkness outside of your house. It's Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. Make sure there's light in your house. We'll be right back after this short break here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network. This is Brent, Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com, back for the third segment of the hour. The substance of these presentations is taken from the Common Lawyer Study Bible. A Common Lawyer Translates and Comments. That study Bible may be obtained by going to www.commonlawyer.com. Commonlawyer.com, when you get there, click on the button that says Books, and then over to the right, you can see where you can click on the words that reference the Common Lawyer Study Bible. You'll find there a further description of it and how you can obtain a copy. Almost. 12,000 footnotes throughout the 66 books of the Bible pay in particular attention to the Hebrew and Aramaic text of the Older Testament and the Greek text of the Newer Testament, detailed head notes to each of the Bible's 66 books, and 49 appendices, all of these comparing and contrasting the law of the land with the law of the city, the laws of nature and of nature's God with the law of politics. Over the years, it has become massive. Therefore, we offer it now on CD. But if you want it in book form, you can get it in four volumes. Again, that's www.commonlawyer.com. You can see there how to obtain a copy of the Common Lawyer Study Bible, a Common Lawyer Translates and Comments Concerning the Holy Bible, a Common Lawyer Translates and Comments. Well, back to the law and the testimony. We're in Deuteronomy, chapter 16, verse 18. Keep in mind that this book, Deuteronomy, this land deed, just as land deeds at common law today in our own country begin with recitals and a description of the parcel of real estate in view, and then, generally, that is followed with what lawyers call covenants. Covenants, these are really conditions of land tenancy. You know, every bit of land in America has conditions of tenancy, and those conditions are not part of any purchase price. For instance, no matter how good your title to a piece of land is, a piece of real estate, there are certain things that you cannot do upon that land, and if you do those things, you have forfeited your right to privacy and If it become known, you'll be stopped. What am I saying? I'm saying this. It is a condition of land ownership in America that you not commit murder on your land and other felonies. Rape, kidnapping, and as a practical matter, if you do that, a good many rights of that bundle of rights that comes along with that land are forfeited. If your land and your buildings become, by your design, an instrumentality of crime, the land will be taken away, forfeited. Well, by analogy, God operates the same way, and it is true that he is the ultimate landlord of all land upon this globe. And Deuteronomy here reveals to us the conditions of land tenancy that God has set. He lists those conditions, their covenants, in chapter 5, Deuteronomy, and then after that, one by one, in order, and there are ten of them, called the Ten Commandments, in order, he expounds them. Here in chapter 16 of Deuteronomy, beginning with verse 18, begins God's clarification, elucidation, of his fifth principle 
called the fifth commandment. And each one of these commandments are principles of relationship, how to maintain good relationship with God, that's the first five, and the second five, horizontally, with your neighbor. Bottom line, these commandments, these first principles, tell us how to love God and love our neighbor. Well, here we begin an exposition of the fifth commandment, the fifth relationship principle, which says in substance this, honor thy father and thy mother. And as one of my first cousins once removed likes to observe, and he rightly observes, the phrase honor thy father and mother is not disjunctive, it is conjunctive. It doesn't say honor your father or your mother. It says honor your father and your mother indeed. It could be consecution. It could rightly be read, honor thy father, then your mother. That would certainly follow the pattern of the Bible. For it is impossible to honor the female of our species without honoring her spouse. And to dishonor a woman's husband is to dishonor her. Some may say, well, what if her husband is a dishonorable, consummate, incurable scoundrel? Well, in the eyes of God, that be the case in every instance. In fact, God says, well, I'll quote him, Who can know the heart of man? It is incurably wicked. The point there he's making is, it's so wicked, it's beyond knowing. The question, who can know the heart of man, is rhetorical. Men are sinners. Paul says they've all gone out of the way. The poison of asps is under their lips. They have all become unprofitable. So just because a man is a scoundrel doesn't mean that you or I or anybody else is any better than him, and the Bible does not, I repeat, it does not qualify the requirement. Honor thy father and mother. No, it doesn't say if they're honorable. And the father must come first. So it could be translated rightly so and There'll be Hebraists that will differ with me, but the truth is that the conjunction here used is often consecutive of time, and it is a theme throughout the Bible, that the honor of mankind, of all men, comes from God alone, the only source of dignity, through the male of the species. I told one of my daughters the other day that I have no dignity outside of my father and no man or woman does have dignity outside of their father and even if their father becomes an overt scoundrel God says he's crowned him with his dignity and image he is the crowning of God's creation and no matter what you think of your father no matter what he's done to you that's not right. And I dare say there has to be something he's done that's not right, because no one's perfect. God demands that you honor your father. No, honoring your mother is not enough. You say, I never knew my father. How can I honor him? Or my father's gone. You honor what he was and your memory of him. You do not speak evil of him because it was through him, by God's effort, through the instrumentality of your father, that you have life. And God forbids you utterly from demeaning that man. Oh, you can confess his sins. The Bible says we are to confess the sins of our fathers. But we ought to do it with all due respect. Well, let's get to the text. Verse 18, chapter 16, says this, Judges and officers shall you make in all the jurisdiction of your 
gates, which the ever alive, the Lord, your lawgiver, the Lord, your God, gives you throughout your tribes, and they shall judge the people with right course of process. Now here we begin talking about the dispersion of power among the entire nation of Israel. Keep in mind that these are conditions of land tenancy. If you don't do this, you're breaking the covenants, the conditions, the land the Lord God himself has set for your inhabiting of the land. What are you to do? You are to appoint judges and the recorders in all the jurisdiction of your gates, plural, plural, throughout your tribes, that means throughout the entire nation, tribes here, analogous to our states, there are 12 tribes, 12 parcels of real estate comprising the nation Israel, just as there are 50 parcels of real estate comprising the United States. And throughout these 50 states, we have appointed judges and recorders. Now the old King James here says judges and officers. The word translated officers, however, chater, denotes one who records, a writer, a scribe, an overseer who, whose office combined a lot of duties, including enrollments of orders. That means recording of orders, recording of births and deaths. In America, we call such a person the county recorder. One such recorder made the news recently down in Kentucky. She refused to issue marriage license to sodomites. That's exactly what this word means. Judges and recorders, and in a common law country, and Israel, according to the terms of the Bible, though not called a common law country, it was, such a country demands recorders. Land deeds, then also, and transference of land is recorded. The county recorder records it here. God says throughout your tribes, and he also makes the point of saying, in all your gates, and I've translated here, in all the jurisdiction of your gates, because that's what it means. The gates are the courts. The word gates, the phrase the gates in the Hebrew tongue, especially in the Older Testament, refers to the jurisdiction of the local court. The reason the ancient Hebrew uses the word gates to refer to the courts is because the courts sat always in the gates, the place of highest visibility and traffic. And then the last part of this verse says, and they shall judge the people with right course of process using due process, that the word gates means the jurisdiction of the courts, is not only taken from history, but the word translated gates means as a verb to contemplate, measure, discuss, and as a noun it means a place of contemplation, measurement, discussion. And because these activities occurred at the place of highest traffic, around a village, city, or walled town. The courts were held at the gates, and the word translated gates means a place of measurement, contemplation, and discussion. This is the place where witnesses testified openly and publicly, where the jury was impaneled, evidence presented and taken, transactions of land perfected before witnesses, again, and before the public. This is where eldership is exercised. Courts in a free country are open to all. Trials are public, and if they are not, that country is no longer free. I went into a courthouse the other day on business. On the other side of the state, in a place called Forgotonia, 
and I walked right in. That's the way it ought to be. This is Brent, Alan Winters, commonlawyer.com. Please join us again next time at the same time here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network.